have with us today Hartosh Singh Bal. He is the political editor of Open Magazine. He's had a very interesting career, starting with studying mathematics and writing a book which connected mathematics with philosophy. How did you swing to journalism from this mathematical background? Well, I came back. I liked traveling. I thought I could write a little bit here and there. I couldn't figure out what else to do. So I came to journalism. It, it often happens, you know, it's the it last refuge of <laughs> a lot of Vinod people. Mehta, I mean, you name uh, so many jo senior journalists. You ask them, how did you become a I couldn't do anything else. I could write a little bit, so I started. I tried a few things. I'd done engineering here before I went into mathematics. I tried mathematics and then I thought, might as well give this a shot. This worked out, so I'm still a journalist, I guess. Now, when Open Magazine started, what was the brief? What was the idea for the magazine? To keep it interesting, to write about things in a way that other people aren't writing about it. Does that explain your contrarian review, uh, contrarian position on almost everything? Such as when uh, first you were against the Lokpal bill, when there was a huge j uh, media support for uh, Anna. And then when the media started uh, thrashing Anna for thrashing people, alcoholics, then open magazine saying, well, it's a good thing he thrashed them because he straightened we them We never up. said that. Well, so now this is where we come to something important about uh, open magazine. What you tend to believe about open magazine is that everything printed in open magazine is a reflection of some open view which is consistently thought out. What makes open interesting is that all of us are free to in many ways express different views in the magazine. There are a huge number of things my editor Manu and I don't agree on and it's pretty visible in the magazine. I think the person who wrote that particular piece was, if I'm not mistaken, Madhavan from Bombay. Again, it's somebody with whom I won't agree on that piece at all. Mm -hmm. My views on the Anna case hadn't changed. He had his own take, we provide that space, we provide space to MG Vedya as well, we provide space to anybody who wants to make an interesting argument. It's not necessary, I agree with. We don't take contrarian positions, we individually take positions that we believe in. Some people see them as contrarian positions, but I'd say that we've been justified over a period of time. If con being contrarian is being right, then I think the evidence bears us out. We were right on 2G, we've been right on the Anna movement. How would that be contrarian? Being right is not being contrarian in the larger sense no, of the but word. But then uh, for the reader you are, because for one minute you, you are uh, criticizing Anna, and then the same magazine is then supporting Anna in him beating up and tying up alcoholics to a tree. So the magazine is taking contrarian positions. Surely that you must understand that when readers take pick up a magazine, they look at the magazine as a whole. Sure, but our, our readers seem to enjoy reading this magazine. We are not tell putting them in a tight framework saying this is what you have to believe. These are the different views that our staff has. We give space to all of them. You see what you like, disagree with what you don't like, give vent to whatever you think is necessary. Is that the culture of Open Magazine that, uh, you know, if this is the running theme in the rest of the media, let's take the opposite? No, not that's necessarily. that's how it seems happening. Not, no, not necessary at all. I mean, it depends. We react to what we believe about a particular piece of information, news or whatever is happening. Now, if the rest of the media chooses to go in un another direction, I mean, that's the rest of the media's concern. We don't look at the rest of the media when we are reporting what we think is right or wrong. You went a little crazy with William Dalrymple. I did not go a little crazy. You went very crazy with William But that's Dalrymple. a matter of interpretation. You went extremely I, crazy with William uh, That's Dalrymple. a matter of interpretation. No, okay. So there was a series of articles and back and forth between you and him. He called <laughs> yeah, you a racist. Absolutely. After which then you ref you define to him what racism means. Absolutely. I think and he didn't understand the term. <laughs> okay. What William Dalrymple wrote, he said, that piece felt, talking about your article, that piece felt little more than the literary equivalent of pouring shit through an immigrant's letterbox. He regretted that statement later. I didn't. I think that's a pretty stupid statement. Because if you have actually experienced what the sense of being an immigrant in the West and having that kind of thing done to you, that. that is not the same as living as a farmhouse in Delhi and having one journalist say that you are the czar of Indian, of the Indian literary scene in what I think is undeserved fashion. These are not equivalent things. If somebody makes that claim, I think he needs to re-examine what he's saying. He did and he in the end agreed with that point that I think he went overboard in this case. And did you ever get to have a scotch with him? 
I did have a scotch with him, but Two, he still three, has no one. One, and he didn't pay for that scotch. He picked it up from a passing train. He has not yet ever paid for a drink. And said, "This is the scotch I promised you." Uh, but it wasn't even scotch. It was a glass of wine, and for a sake, a <laughs> glass of wine. You know, you you can make out one glass of wine at that. Talking about this element, which I think for the first time has been not the first time, but the first time in such detail and with reflection, somebody has brought up this kind of still post-colonial hangover that we do have of uh, not being successful until the West accepts us. And that started with Satyajit Ray. It started and, and has continued over the years that whether it's books or lit uh, literature, film, even acting. Sure. Um, definitely our, the next generation, say my children's generation, do n I don't see them having that hangover at all. Sure. But our generation and your generation still seems to have it. And what do you think we can do about it? Well, I think what happens is that as we keep getting better at things, in the sense that I think in certain fields that distinction has gone. You know, I, I don't think an Indian mathematician feels inferior to an American mathematician just because somebody is American or somebody is Russian or somebody is English. Uh, no, I don't think we ever feel inferior, but we do feel elated when the accolades come sure. from the West. So it is our colonial history that connects us with the US and UK. I mean, in, in terms of literature, I think, and I personally believe that far more interesting stuff is coming out of Europe, which is of more direct concern to us from Eastern Europe, from what was Eastern Europe and Europe. But since English connects us to the UK and US, but as societies, the UK and India are such very different societies that really much of that literature, I don't think impinges on us directly. I think it's a problem. Also, it creates different models because I mean, writers take up models when they write, they look at what they have written. The, I think the English novel with its lack of engagement with ideas of a huge number of issues is not the best model for us. You know. And I think we do make a mistake in terms of Indian literature, uh, writing in English when we look at these models, which is why I think our, a lot of our fiction is so disappointing. I'd say in the last 10 years, I don't think there have been very but many. But we have moved uh, a huge uh, step away from the, col uh, the post-colonial writers such as Dom Murray's, um, Naipaul, Ved Mehta. They, their books are continuously explaining the native, the brown man to the white man, and they are the coconut in between. Sure. That I know the natives, so I will explain them to you because sure. I'm not like them, I'm better than them. Sure. That's the continuous position that all these writers, Naipaul, Ved Mehta, or the whole lot of them uh, took. And then uh, Salman Rushdie comes along and then stops explaining. He's the first writer actually who stopped explaining us to them. If he wrote about Rekha, he expected you to know that she was a an, uh, a Mumbai actress. Combination of Hindi and English and all kinds of things and play of words which only an Indian reader sure. could understand. He never explained, like the Latin American writers. So in that, there was a huge step. Since then, the new writers that, uh, that I would look at now, such as Ranandas Gupta, who's not writing about India but is gone on an international scene, other young writers such as um, Arvind. Now, what do you think of Arvind? He has no colonial, he's not looking for Just the West. Look at Chetan Bhagat, he's an extreme. He doesn't even want to write grammatical English. Sure. I mean, it's not merely just about grammatical English, but we can get into it. Uh, see, Rana is an interesting writer. I didn't particularly like Adiga's book, I think the one you're referring to, because I think it rang false to me. I think it is uh, the, the, the driver that he tried to represent did not come through very well to me. I think it just reveals the kind of distance that most Indians have from a particular class when they try and bring it into fiction. And uh, I think that showed very much up in that book. So I, I'm just saying that there are larger questions which are peculiar to our situation, which I think the writers immediately after independence were much more aware of and wrestled with. I mean, in terms of language, much before Rushdie, I think people like uh, Desani and Raja Rao were yeah, addressing these questions yeah. very, very clearly. And I think their answers, if we, uh, Rushdie at his best is, not a model that I would advise. I mean, at his worst, he can be very bad as well. So, I mean, that depends on which Rushdie we are talking about. But if you look at the works of uh, Raja Rao, I think he's clearly wrestled with the question of language and how in a bilingual space or a trilingual space, how we deal with these issues in literature. And I think these are important questions which we still today 
don't seem to be able to answer clearly because uh, I think there are Pakistani writers who manage this much better than us. One of the best books I've read in the recent past is Daniel Moinuddin's in other rooms, other wonders. And what he manages exactly is this, that he manages to show interactions across various classes written out in English, but clearly the differences of language, gestures and interactions comes through in a book that I've never seen come through in an Indian book. I mean, Adika's driver for has, might as well be another middle class person sitting in the same room as mm. is the, the businessman. There is no real difference as far as I can see. So what do you he think of Chetan Bhagat? Not much at all. I try not to think about Chetan Bhagat. So isn't it courageous <laughs> to not fall in line sure. with what is considered good literature? I, I don't mean to be facile in that way, but sometimes I do actually, but that's different. All I'm trying to say is that uh, Chetan Bhagat, let's strip everything out, he's a good storyteller. At the heart of his books is a story that appeals to a lot of Indians. But you know, let's not confuse that issue with literature. I, I People have great problems with this, but literature is, for me, Good literature has always been an elitist enterprise to show numbers and say that there's something important about numbers. I'm glad that exists because it provides money for good advances and sustenance of good authors. And I think there's a mass market out there. But I mean that that we have to discuss Chetan Bhagat when we are literature uh, when we are discussing literature. I don't think is necessary at all. I think that's very snobbish. Uh, that's okay. I think literature is at the heart an elitist pursuit. We should not try and invent this whole idea of literature as reaching out to everybody. There are various genres that do it, various people who do it, but there are some things in which you don't have to... Culture in the highest sense across the world at all times has always been an elitist pursuit, in India particularly so. And just because in a democratic society we are afraid of seeing these things doesn't make it untrue because a good literature also requires an honesty of engagement with oneself and one society it ne does not necessarily look to the market and say, will this work in the market out there? But don't you think Chetan Bhagat has that? He has an honesty about himself. He's not putting on any... An honesty about himself when he speaks to you... No, on in his camera, writing. In, in his, his writing is very what I've simple. Read, no, but I mean, being simple doesn't make you honest. To, that is to say that the idea of... Uh, human beings are complicated necessarily to say simplicity is no, honesty. No, but he's writing about a culture that rings true to a lot of people. That is what you're talking about, honesty. No, I'm talking about honesty to himself. I think Chetan Bhagat, if you look at his own writings constantly in terms of how he writes, is always addressing this question of, will this work with my audience or not? Can they accept this? Can they not? Is it in the paradigms? I think Chetan writes the way I think any good scriptwriter for a soap opera in this country writes. Okay. Um, now, Matt Daniels in Mumbai Boss, uh, said this about you. He said, uh, Bal's essay typifies the Molotov lobbying style for which Open has gained notoriety. Like the brawl at which a hockey game broke out, Open occasionally practices serious journalism alongside its pugilism. Bal manages somehow to allude to the radia tapes in each of his uh, pieces. We can be sure that when they bring up India's colonial hangover, they're spoiling for a fight. By contrast, when the Times of India talks about Raj literature, it means Rajasthani. Then he continues, Bal's umbrage gambit has succeeded. Why else does the scrappy upstart take a swing at the heavy heavyweight? So you're a scrappy upstart, open. Well, I mean, I'm glad Matt within, Daniels reads us this closely. I don't know who he is, but I'm glad the, that we have a reader who's so fond of us. Within the literary establishment whose solicitude he scorns, he has carried a tiny bit of recognition. Or failing that, a scotch. You didn't even get a scotch. I didn't get a scotch. <laughs> but I've got recognition but, from Matt Daniels. Maybe that's what I should worry about. No, it doesn't. I'm, I'm glad people engage with it. People can dislike it, like it. I think it's good that people are reading it closely. And I think disagreement is part of what it makes it important that we engage in these debates. About your understand. You've written and spoken about on television how you don't believe fasts are valid because of the constitution and it, it was a, a necessary uh, tool that Gandhi and various other peoples used f at a time which was different and in, this, in today's time it has no place at all. Now what happens when you see a government the way it is today where it actually does not engage with the people, every policy that they pass, they do, do not even go to the people either in villages or on television 
or have press conferences to explain their position, whether it's the nuclear position, their position on the nuclear deal, with their position on Narega, it was just passed without anybody debating it, without explaining or going to the people. So it's a very isolated government in the way it has functioned. It's, or it is really colonial. How do you crack a dent? How do you get through to a government like that if you don't use tools such as what Anna did? Well, I think, see, it's nobody's argument that we are a perfect democracy or anybody close to it. On the other hand, when somebody like Prashant Bhushan argues that we need to be a participatory democracy where everybody's will is sought every time we have to make a decision, that is a ridiculous argument. That is to forget the whole history of democracy. You can't have a democracy where you're going to decide after the parliamentary attack whether India and Pakistan should be at war or not and press buttons and suddenly the majority says let's go attack Pakistan and we'll go attack Pakistan. The representative democracy works through representatives sitting in parliament and fine, we've had a problem with that. We have mechanisms, we keep struggling and it's going to be a slow struggle. Our democracy is not going to change in one year because somebody sits on fast, lives or dies. It's going to change because people keep pushing it. The democracy changes will come 10, 20, 30 years. If you look at the kind of participation we have in our democracy, people may not like it. But what we keep saying is criminal, lumpen, it's actually far more representative of what this society is than this democracy. Society 30, 40, is also criminal no, lumpen. 30, 40 years ago, if you look at the constitution of parliament and look at how parliament is constituted today, those people may be learned, educated, but they were part of a certain elite. We've gone through and made parliament far more representative. It has its problems. People may not like it, but this is in some sense a reflection of how the country has changed, it is getting represented, it is problematic and we need to keep checking it through the media, through the judiciary, through civil activism. But it's not going to change in half a year because somebody thinks one bill and one fast is going to change it. In fact, I think that has, I made that argument over and over again. You look at the 2G, you look at the questions being asked of the Congress after, on corruption after the 2G. What has happened to that? Instead, for one year, we've been arguing with that party about the Lokpal bill, that which should have only been one part of the whole question of how this government is going on, how it is operating, its answerability. But all that has become, become the background to this one man, whose stand I don't know in anything, whom I can't even question on anything. I mean, even the, the, even the Congress party is... I have more understanding of where it stands on a huge number of issues than I have of where Anna stands on anything. But on every issue, wherever there has been uh, a decision taken, and particularly in this area, for example, when um, Aruna Roy worked with a team of other people also, including Arvind Kejriwal, for the RTI Act, um, it happened. Now, albeit she did not go on fast or whatever, and she worked through the system, but you have to see that the people who are in power are not going to give away their power easily. And they're not, certainly not going to hand it over to people like Anna and Arvind Kejriwal and Prashant Bhushan. Now, today, as the government exists today, the CBI, the Income Tax Department, Enforcement Directorate, are you, these are three agencies that are used to fix people, whether it's journalists or the journalist owners, the uh, owners of publications, or political enemies. These are three agencies that are used in much the same way it would be in a totalitarian state. So they may make the pretense of making a commission of inquiry, but then the ED and income tax and all the raids start and people are hung up to dry and they look guilty to the, to the average person that uske ghar mein raid ho gaya, wo to dishonest nikla, uske itne nikle hi wor. So now how do you correct a system like that which has an inbuilt a way to harass for, by the party in power, and I don't say only Congress, all the parties in power have done it. Sure. Look, first of all, I, I think the comparison with a totalitarian state is extreme. I mean, I've worked as a journalist in this country, and a lot of us have, and there are degrees of coercion, but I don't think in the real long term, if we are doing good stories, standing by what we are doing, that we need to necessarily fear anything like this happening over and over again. I'm not saying that there haven't been one or two cases where it's happened. If we go back to whether the CBI, the ED institutions like this, how they should function, I think that question need not necessarily be tied with what they do to journalists necessarily, but I think the larger question of how these institutions operate, yes, we must examine it. But to say in a representative democracy that bodies which wield large amounts of executive power 
should be free of political control is to go against the very basis on which our system is designed. Tomorrow, somebody goes and says the SP in the district should be given a freedom from any political control. But who is the SP answerable to? If you look at the US system, a sheriff is directly elected by the people. The sheriff is answerable because he can be voted in and out of power. Who is this SP if he's not being controlled by the political system? The political system is imperfect, so the control creates its own forms of problems. But the SP as an autonomous body, not answerable to the people, not answerable to the parliament, what kind of sense does that make? No, but Hartosh, if you have these agencies who are being used, I mean, even a milder example such as Doordarshan, each political party that comes into power treats it as their own private channel sure. for their own propaganda. Now that's public money. It's our channel. They sh it should be used for the public, Absolutely. public's benefit, not for the party's propaganda. And these are the elements which undermine a democracy because a public enterprise such as Doordarshan, all these agencies sure. that I've mentioned are supposed to be for the people. But the minute any coalition or political party comes into power, they are the ones who are going to appoint whoever's in charge of these agencies. Sure. So they control, call the shots, they tell them who to go and raid. I, you can be sure that uh, any investigation on the owner of a publication has not been started by enforcement director sure. or an it's income tax on their sure. own. They're not self-starters. Sure. It comes from a political directive. Sure. And isn't that dangerous? Of course it's dangerous. And I am saying that this, these institutions cannot be allowed to function in these ways, but the answers that we have to look for are far more complicated. It cannot just be simply a question of we will grant the director an autonomy which frees him from political control as if political control is evil. But political control in the end is the only kind of control a citizen has, however imperfectly it happens. What we have to do is create mechanisms where certain checks exist, where ways of examining exist, where parliament does its job far better, where the media is constantly watching out, where there are other agencies. This kind of misdirection, for example, is punished Part of the reason is our judiciary functions improperly. We, we need faster execution of justice. Uh, the whole system has to be tinkered with, tampered with. We don't like the word tinkering, but the fact is change happens in most cases slowly over a period of time pushing against these things. It's not going to happen suddenly if you decide that CBI is an autonomous body. You have somebody sitting in an autonomous body who runs amok, what control do you have on that man? I mean, I can ask the same question, you know, I mean, what happens if you have a CBI director who has an agenda of his own that he wants to pursue? That's who also is, happened. It, it has, has happened. happened. Who is he going to answer Now, tell to? me, um, when you first received the Radia tapes in Open Magazine, what was your reaction? See, the existence of these tapes had been around, for, uh, I mean, it oh, is six not... Six months before. Six months. Excerpts from these tapes, some ways in written form, were being circulated around. They had actually the names of the organization's office phone numbers. And even before these tapes came with... Names of organizations of the people who were sent, had these tapes? Uh, no, no. Mm. Of the organizations which were responsible for the taping. You know. I mean, the, we are talking of communications from the within the income tax to the CBI, the CBI asking for these tapes and the income tax saying the, these are the excerpts of the kind of information I have but not... who instigated income tax to tape Neera Radia? There are millions of people who are dodging their taxes. Why did they tape her? Good question. I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but I think in the end, it seems that there was a good case for taping her. Uh, uh, but not for income tax, because they didn't find anything on that. Well, I, the case hasn't yet been totally shut or closed. Whatever has happened to that case is still going on, lingering. Uh, there are certain guidelines and I'm not saying that we don't need to go back and look at the guidelines, but from the media's point of view, when the tapes come to us, those guidelines already existed. These tapes, we have evidence that there is these, this kind of information on the tapes, bit, exchanged between departments and you know, it was as simple as that. I called up the department in both those cases and checked, you know, has this letter, this with the DO number, etc., has been written by you. Mm. They just said, look, we can't get into all this, but yes, this DO number letter has been issued, this has been. So those documents, whoever is circulating them were genuine. The organizations themselves are certifying it. The tapes come into your hands. The excerpts on those documents, 
match with what is there on the tapes mm -hmm. and then when you start listening to the tapes i'm aghast you know i mean as a journalist you know to a certain degree that there is influence peddling going on in this country how this country operates at a certain level in delhi but even then nothing had prepared me for what i heard on but the stage. people who uh, person who gave you the tapes the cds did you have any question on their motive see the tape came through us through via media several people i will not get into that but it came through from people that we could trust but right behind them who was giving the cd out who did it who didn't i still don't know the answer to that did they have motives of course they had motives i mean every story that comes to a journalist comes with motives it's our job to check what those motives are whether the impact of the story what it implies outweigh the kind of personal motives that the person who's brought the story to us and that's a judgment we make every day and in this story there was no question i don't know what somebody hoped to gain by it because if i start looking and people have proposed all sorts of corporate conspiracies but i don't think there's any corporate involved in that sector which has actually gained from this these tapes being out they've all been hurt in some way or the other maybe they didn't anticipate this but it doesn't seem to me that really anybody's interest there in corporate in the corporate world has been served as far as i can make out but initially why was then tony j sudarshan talking to reporters about this and giving excerpts see i don't know what reporters do or interact with all i know is that in my journalistic career i have never met tony j sudarshan i know that tony j sudarshan will not step into the open office if he has some reason to do so he wants to do in official capacity he can come and talk to us but we have no interaction with tony j sudarshan we have nothing to do with the man i particularly have a great degree of i will use the word frankly loathing for this kind of means of operating in the city i will have no truck with these people i never have never will actually but uh, supposing you got the cd from somebody from that who gave it from tony jesus also I, i don't know and i can't speculate if it was from tony jesus or some what his motives were perhaps he can answer i'm sure he would have motives but really even if he had motives the final impact of those tapes and what they meant far outweigh any motive he may have had that now uh, did it occur to you that there are areas in the tapes such as the discussions that um, barkhadat had with nira radia uh, that there was a large part of the, that discussion which was not um, made public there were many days where she was discussing uh, get trying to get an interview with both raja and kani mozi so uh, which cutting that air, all that all those discussions out and leaving only the part where she is talking about oh my god what should i tell them now it sort of uh, doesn't show the full context perhaps it doesn't show the full context all i'm trying to say is that what is there on those tapes whatever the background is not justifiable in journalistic terms what it implies is not justifiable even if it was being done in exchange for a story you do not trade these kind of things you do not operate in this way as a journalist it doesn't matter what the larger context was there is enough evidence on those tapes corroborated by things other people are saying which lead me to say no this is not acceptable in journalism did you have any sort of Uh, apprehension about going in to this kind of a story which exposes fellow journalists see to me once you hear the tapes and you see the kind of contours no i mean i don't have that kind of apprehension yes i think that it is important this kind of information be out there the tapes were with us for I'd say over a month before we finally published them, and you know, I mean, I heard them over and over again. Apart from the documents, I, I am checking internal consistency. Somebody here is saying something. Somebody else is saying here. Uh, everything ties up. The timings tie up. So and so has said. I've spoken to so and so. He said this to this person. There's another tape which says yes, this has happened. 
there is no way that somebody can concoct that entire battery of it is technically not feasible you know that you work in the with that kind of precision and that kind of conciseness and every one of the important details tally you know and that is when it starts striking you this is my god this is true this is what is happening so everybody had these tapes but um, only open and outlook decided to run them uh, although we headlines today post. One day before. <laughs> well, that you have to ask Outlook. Not technically, we broke the story, Outlook followed, is the way I would put uh, it. Well, Vinod puts it differently. He well, says we will the argue. Date on the <laughs> over that one date. And that, that only Open and Outlook are aware of. I think the average reader doesn't basically care. Open was not known before this big scoop. So it put you on the map. So in that sense, it's, it's then served your purpose. Well, but I'm sure it helped open, but I mean, that was the res result of a decision we had taken of journalism we had done, you know, in the sense we put it out there, the story was never questioned. It was also a vindication of the fact that there were journalists in this organization who have a history of doing journalism. I mean, for better or worse, whether people like it or not, that it's a vindication of that. It isn't that any magazine can come out anywhere and print whatever they want and suddenly it will be. And really to see that Yes, we got mileage out of a story, but then why else does any organization print a story? Mm -hmm. So tell me about the Indian Express story on the troop movements. Yeah. What do you think of that story? See, I'm confounded. I ran an interview with Vinod where Vinod s spoke many things. I don't know the inside story. He called story. it a Himalayan mistake. He, he called it a huge blunder. Mm. Uh, I don't know the details of the story. I do not cover defense. I don't know how it pans out, but I was perplexed by the fact that the kind of uh, play it was given, you know, editors have to make two decisions, whether the story is worth it and when the story is worth it, what kind of play and how you describe it out. Now, if it was a story about the government getting spooked, I think that's an important story. Okay. And if the evidence tallies with that, the government that actually felt that this, I still don't think that it goes anywhere near what the Express did with the story. I mean, tomorrow if there's an actual who in this country, how is the Express going to play it? I mean, it amazes me that this, this kind of play could come to it. The play itself is an editorial judgment and answerability. And when it screams you in this fashion, you want to know, yes, what is it that you are trying to say? If the people read it as a story about this implying a coup, that implication is sort of inbuilt in the kind of play the Express gave to that story. I think it was less of a coup, more of sort of rattling the sabers. Rattling the sabers, well, rattling the sabers. I can see that as a front page story. But as the only front page story, <laughs> screaming, raising all sorts of questions and doubts, at that point you start wondering what has happened to editorial judgment. I, to I don't think you would have handled it any differently. You got a story like that. Well, I don't think anybody's giving me the express to run <laughs> in any case. So I, I don't think no, that's but, a but I would if never. If you got it in open, you would have run it the same uh, way. If, if, I was, the if I was the editor of a newspaper, I would not run it as the entire front page with a three deck headline. But you put it, it on the cover of, of uh, if open. If I could verify the details, it would not be written the way it was written. See, I'm saying this with great care. I've learned my journalism at the Express. It's an institution I value but enormously. I'm sure the, but the but three I, bylines, I'm sure they check there. Well, look, that, those are questions you have to ask them. But I do have a problem with the, the way that story was played out. And if I was in a newspaper, that story would not have been written that way and run in that way. That, that is my feeling on that. And that is where the real impact of the story comes from. So yes, you do ask questions about how this is played out. Yeah, but it always seems to be when you're not in it, you know. Well, well sure. I mean, I'm willing to answer. You, you ask me questions about the radio tape of stories that we've run. Go ahead, ask. I'm willing to answer all these questions. I think it's only so fair that other... You the, you're other willing to answer, then who gave you the radio tapes? No, because I mean, there are certain lines that you have drawn. If somebody comes and gives you material on the condition that is confidential, as a journalist, Mathur, you won't ask that question. Yeah, I'm just trying. Galti se bol doge. galti nahi honi chahiye. But see, the point is we need an openness about things. If you feel something is wrong, you say it. I'm not saying I could be wrong or that we don't make mistakes, yes, but I think we need to put this out in the open and discuss it, yeah? Would it be a question of envy? Probably sure. But I mean, I can't sit and dismiss every criticism of the 2G story or the way the Radia story was played and say, yeah, you know, it's a question of envy, you know? I mean, you have, I would say, answer whatever criticism has come my way, look at the questions, say, 
we did this because of this. I mean, these are stories which have such a resonance that I think we are in some ways duty bound to put our explanations out. Hmm. What do you think of all the stuff that's been happening on paid news and the kind of journalism or the kind of business times of India runs? See, I think paid news, I worked uh, for a long time in s s districts in Punjab, then in Bhopal. Nothing about paid news is something that comes as a surprise to me, that it is being done by the Times of India here in Delhi is what is the real surprising thing. No, I mean, to me, frankly, it is beneath contempt that any organization, media organization can deal with news in this fashion. Uh, the problem in this country is that, you know, it's easy to take a sanctimonious position just against paid news. When uh, paid news largely by now, I know the contours of it, how it works, how it operates, it's out there. My real problem in Delhi is with the, the same kind of unpaid news, which is... Access <laughs> press. <laughs> yes. Vanity press and access <laughs> press. Which is put out in newspapers every day where you know that people have certain affiliations, they are close to certain parties, they are mouthing certain positions, they are placing themselves in certain... Uh, they are lobbying for something else in the background. The, the, these are things that we as a journalist know. We can't present it as evidence. But the large mass of people sitting and reading these newspapers have no idea that this is what is behind the news that happens. No, I think it's become the other way around. That because of the atmosphere now created by this, the average reader not only does not have any idea, they are cynical about everybody now. Sure. Every journalist has been painted with one brush. That sure. media is all corrupt. And so that is the problem now that our credibility has become, has hit bottom level because of a few. And uh, you lose your credibility, which is supposed to be our USP. We're finished. Absolutely. And see, we, we get ca caught up. I mean, in this country, probably everywhere in the world, people always look for, I mean, in its largest sense, it takes back to this natural laws. People don't believe that events can happen by chance. People look for conspiracies everywhere. That if I were to say that the 2G story came to us, we looked at it. Uh, there is always the question of examining what was the motivation, who benefited, who didn't. Sometimes the simple truth is simply that nobody had control over the day we decided to run the tapes. No, the tapes were lying for two months. If somebody wanted to control it, our decision to run the tapes could have happened anywhere in those two months. Nobody had control over the timing. But you see, this is the problem that now if you look at the social media, people are seeing ghosts everywhere. Even when simple things happen, straightforward things happen, sure. there's always the question of why this way, why, why this, this time, sure. who, who promoted it, who, did, who planted it. Absolutely. Even for the most straightforward story, everything is now, there's a, I mean, journalism is supposed to be where you suspend disbelief. Today, it's completely the opposite. Sure. People are not believing anything. Well, part of it is our fault. I mean, as I said, some of, as you were just elaborating, yes, there are journalists, newspapers functioning in ways and manners which can be questionable. And as journalists, we know what those problems are. But part of it is that, you know, huge questions of transparency about the media. For example, for me, the most basic issue is that we as a country forget this whole question of regulation. Transparency about funding and earning in the media is where we need to begin with. Which means, I mean, I proposed this several times that uh, freedom of information, access to the public and everybody else of the business side of media in this country should be part of anything that we envisage. It should be something we should be doing voluntarily. An RTI should be allowed for any business part of any media house. But it's Hartosh, a public you know how it's done. There are wheels within wheels in the ownership. Sure. There are f there's a front company, then a, 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 sure. a little offshoot company. You don't know. Even if you make it transparent, it's not transparent. It's not transparent. It but we, we begin to then start answering certain questions. If an organization is making so much, if this is what its revenues are, if where is the money coming from? If the money is coming from a certain place, you know that you can answer it. If you don't understand what those sources of funding are. There is no clarity if the organization can survive year after year on a lack of earnings, yet there is no funding to sustain it in a declared sense. Those questions then have to be answered. You know, I mean, those so things then, have to be yeah, up front. A lot of channels and a few channels and a few news organizations would be exposed to who's really funding them. T tell me, are you against book fest, literary festivals? You went to the one in Mumbai. I went for one day. I mean, that why did you break down and go? 
tell you, uh, it was somewhat of a joke, but uh, I did say that in Bombay. I did, didn't go down well in Bombay, but it was basically <laughs> because Anil Dharkar had invited. What did you say? Well, Anil Dharkar had invited me. So nobody has invited you to the Jaipur no, Literature no, no, Festival. No. That's why you've been bitching I, about well, them. This comes back to my point about literary festivals. I think Dharkar didn't know the debt every engineering college student in the 80s owes to Dharkar. He used to edit a certain magazine called Debonair. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that was my only reason for going to a excuse, literary festival. <laughs> excuse my being squeamish. Blah. It was a horrible <laughs> magazine. <laughs> There were times and places where it had yeah. certain... Okay, for adolescence. <laughs> yes. But um, why did you go? You've been... Well, I told you've you been I mean, this is about, about the most okay, serious so that, reason I can come up so with that means, going to a So that means festival. if you're invited to Jaipur, you'll come? No, I... I yes, you will. Uh, no, no, you'll no, have no, to climb down and come. Stop being a snob. Thank no. you. Well, Thank you very no. much, Hartosh, for a lovely <laughs> <Really>? interview. <laughs>